In this video, we look at a motor driver board recently designed based on the DRV8835. The motor driver I see, the DRV8835, is basically a H bridge that's implemented in a small tiny package. And this allows to control the direction of your motor that you're driving or inductive load, and thus allowing us to place the motor in forward, reverse, brake or coast depending on that state and this is all depend on the mode in which the IC is enabled in and what what lines we are driving through it. Think about this in the schematic review video of this exact project. Going over the overall features of this board it includes temperature sensor, pressure sensor, the current sensibility for the motor itself, we I have my weapon of choice the JTAG connector and an external motor power supply. All of these I will explain when it comes to it. Let's start off with the USB-C. This is what is powering our board fed through a ferret bead filter so just a pi filter with a ferrite bead in it as opposed to an inductor or a resistor whatever your flavor is towards our buck boost converter again this was a reused design and i know it works i would have placed a buck converter instead for this application as it would be more appropriate as you all would know though i will touch upon the topic of design reuse in the future but that is besides the point we are here for the board so i tend to have a preference for pores as opposed to tracks when it comes to power delivery and but though i think this is just preference and as you can see here i use a mix of both and I think it's uh, just purely situational what you want to do. Though I would say this, when it comes to layout, I would urge you to copy the layout that the manufacturer has set. So for this IC here, I'll put the layout on screen. This is what it shows and I've tried to mimic it as close as possible. And I must say myself, I've done a darn good job, except for this polygon pour over here. This could have been for us much better, but it is what it is. It's a hobbyist type, hobbyist type board. And I do apologize for the lack of rationality in this video that it didn't have much time on me though it's no excuse for poor layout and poor design and besides the layout we see this coming fed off into our 3v3 which is powering the rest of our system being fed through four vias over here you may be wondering that what are these vias are there for besides power delivery couldn't you just use one why did you use four and this was completely on purpose as this was completely on purpose as i, I wanted to illustrate for this video that you may have seen this in designs in which vias are staggered and such this is for power conversion to how many vias you can push through so if you think of it that if you had one fire you're pushing through all that energy for this one singular fire which is okay for low current applications and it's perfectly fine if the fire can withstand it no problem whatsoever though if you had a large amount of power flowing you're depositing literally all that energy into the one single fire there's going to be issues so that's why people put multiple fires to help deposit with that to help deposit all that energy into your board but how do you calculate that how do i find that out there's lots of calculators online so it's always worth giving a check so if you're working with higher current see how many fires do you need to handle that and by using various calculators online we can see what the current rating of this VI is and we can see how much we can squeeze through and upon calculation four vias is way too much for our, our ability here and we don't really need it we could get away with one swimming over here we have our jtag signal and i've placed this part as close to the ic as i can get it because that is the name of the game short and sweet traces especially for our clock lines and our swdio i'm not too fussed about the reset line it's i imagine it's just gonna be it's just gonna be flicked on on or off well, this is actually might be communicating, be communicating during our programming. So I want this short and sweet. So that is why I've chosen to go with this closer to this end than with this end. And that's one thing I keep into factor when I'm placing these, these tag connects or any type of connectors which signal is more important. Since we're already here, let's take a look at our microcontroller and we see signals coming out to our motor driver. This was explained in our previous schematic video, so I won't go over it too much. And we see test points that are placed along here and they are, these are something that you should always place in your designs. The more the better, I say. And that's because you don't know what's gonna go wrong and you might as well place it if you're especially using something new i've used this design i've used this in the past and i'll explain this error over here in a bit i've used this ic in the past and i know it works so it's fine i shouldn't really have these anyway i shouldn't have any face problems but i think it's good practice to always keep them on to always keep them on i'd say uh, for the routing of these signals i'm not too bothered about it because they will just be gpio and we won't be switching a motor at incredible speeds so i can route them without much concern though ideally i still would have liked some ground pour if i could have in between these signals feeding out of our motor driver i see some consideration is to be made so coming out of here this device can run up to 1.5 amps per driver so we need to ensure our traces can survive this for a worst case scenario what i mean by this is that these traces have been routed 
to be able to handle 1.5 amps. And again, this is something that if you're new to whatever, whatever you're doing, that traces do have a limited amount of current they can carry for their width and whatever, an amount of copper. So if you had a really thin trace, so let's say you took a, let's you, you look up a very complicated design online, you see like loads of traces coming out of like a BGA package and whatever. I can guarantee you more than not, those traces cannot withstand 1.5 amps of current. They will just burn up and frizzle. Well, this can. So this is why I l I tend to have a look at them when you're dealing with higher amounts of current is that you need to make sure your traces could handle this. Again, tons of online calculators can be found onto what you can calculate. I recommend Saturn PCB. It's a free little piece of software comes with every calculator on the planet and it's very, very helpful. But then you may be wondering, well, well, you say all this, but you still have, you still have thin traces different to to hear, for example, you just have it wandering all over the place. What's up with that? That is a good, that is a good question. Like why, why has it become thinner along here and fatter along here and what not? And what if you have a really small trace? And I'll tell you this, and even here, I could have really just brought it down to the pad size here. And I'll tell you this, it's okay to bring it into the pad size because it will have to be shortened at some point of time, but I will immediately fatten it up so from here, so what I could have done really, uh, of course, this this design may not. I could have put a 0.5 here. Just have to move that. So I could have put I've put a 0.5 here, and we see this feeding into a slightly smaller one. You can't really fit it through because of the other design, other trace in here. And so you see, I have less amount of energy being forced through a smaller little. Can I think of it as a funnel almost, where everything's just being squished and getting narrower and narrower. But if you have it steadily, and obviously this is something that's up for debate, if you have it just immediately narrow, it's going to be quite hard and more chance of errors. So that's why we have different size tracks, and I believe always a fattening exercise of the tracks is always a good thing to do after you've you know laid it all out and everything, because you're not done immediately. You still have to go through certain things to make sure check and everything's all right, optimal layout and whatnot. The sense resistor itself and the IC is to be aware of when selecting the resistor, ensure it can meet power requirements for what you're putting through. So again, these. So the power requirements, how much power are you actually going to push through this? So I believe this board can do up 12 volts, 1.5 amps and power just V times I. And there you get your power requirement. So make sure you have a resistor that can withstand it. Without, and if you don't, it might just end up blowing up or releasing the smoke. So there's something to keep in mind of when you come to placing the, your current sense resistor. And you can get them all different flavors at SMD. And then just literally look like metal, just metal pieces coming across. For this one, in fact, it kind of looks like a, kind of see what you, like, like a FET almost. So... This current sensor, this current sense I see is an analog out and it's coming through here. Particularly, I wouldn't like to do this as it's going through via It's I don't like really switching through. I'm sure it wouldn't make that much of a difference, but I want to keep trying to keep everything in one layer, especially for these analog signals or digital signals. You should try to keep everything in one layer if you can. And I did this through here and I tried to keep, you know, have all the ground poor in the world to isolate the signal in between. So that so on okay. And if we move over here, we have this one. Before I had it close up to here and I didn't have any ground pour between, but now I've moved it closer to here. I've got some ground pour to provide that guard trace around it, which is ideal, of course. Ideally, also maybe if I was really concerned about it, I would have chucked in a low pass filter of some sort. And I would take the worst case scenario for what frequency may be induced into it and try and filter that out as effectively as possible within design constraints and money constraints. You don't need to design a very, very, very effective filter if you're just doing something simple to keep it, you know, sweet. And it's about weighing up your options, really, at the end of the day. Uh, coming into the overall layout of the device, it's nothing too complex. There's nothing too special going on here. It's just simple on and off switches and whatnot. The switching things just keep them away from signals, put ground traces, guard traces around here. Follow layouts when you can. The I squared C signals, nothing too much, too special going on here. I'm just trying to keep a guard trace around here, so keep a nice copper pour around to prevent this. And I've stuck some vias in to prevent antenna, and I could probably stick one over here for that matter. Also, it's the same reason why I go with a stitching via. Sorry, stitching vias to knit everything down together. It's the same kind of scenario, same kind of thing that you want to do. St stitch it all together. It also helps to reduce floating islands and antennas and whatnot on your board and the rest uh, peripherals user button reset button led whatever which you can see from here now that that's all covered let's actually get to the improvements of the board what can actually be